Um, okay, so before I introduce myself, um, I want to tell you a quick story. So recently I um, interviewed a, an engineer for a position who had a Node.js background. And um, uh, Node.js is really great. But this is Node.js uh, conference, right? No, no, shit. Um, okay, so he had a lot of Node.js background and, uh, and I asked him a question. I said, so what do you like about Node.js? And he said, well, it's um, single-threaded. It's awesome. And I said, okay, but well, what does that mean? And he couldn't explain it. Um, so he didn't get the job, but the important part of the story is that it made me realize that um, maybe there are developers out there who are either using um, concurrency and async technologies or want to use it, and they really don't know what it means and they're kind of scared of this whole topic. So um, it's interesting that I think this room alone hosted uh, three <laughs> talks about async IO just today, um, which really is, is pretty significant um, and tells that a lot of people are interested in this. So I'm, this talk, I'm really gonna try to demystify uh, what this is and why is that relevant uh, within the context of web development. So, uh, Hi everybody, my name is Amit, Amit Nabarro. I come from Israel. This is a photo of uh, Tel Aviv. Um, kind of looks like Rimini, I suppose. Yeah, uh, it's really hot right now, and, uh, uh, but it's a lot of fun. Um, I work for uh, 475 Cumulus, which is a consultancy, consultant agency. Um, and I uh, rant and let out on my uh, Twitter feed uh, over there. Okay, so how many people here are doing web development with Python? Okay, that's a good, good number. So uh, you guys probably know at least one of the frameworks uh, which are now on the screen. Uh, probably Django is the most prominent one or at least the one mostly used, uh, but there are all other kinds like Pyramid and Flask and, and I think actually it's a really long list. Um, and all those frameworks, they have, um, they have, first of all, those are frameworks. Those are not web servers, if anyone has ever made a mistake to confuse that. Those are libraries. Um, but the important thing is that they all have one thing in common um, and the the common thing that they all share is that they all work or implement WSGI. WSGI is a standard which was first established in 2003. And basically what it, it is, it's, it's a glorified CGI, if anyone's old enough to know what that is. Um, and um, it basically the whole point of WSGI was to try to um, create a specifications where Python uh, web frameworks can easily work under uh, um, production web servers. Um, and, and, and the way WSGI works is that you write your app um, in a framework which supports WSGI and then pretty much any production web server like Apache or Nginx can hook up to it and serve your application. And you don't really need to know how that works and you don't really need to care. You can really just focus on the application logic. Um, so, but what's wrong with WSGI? Well, actually nothing is wrong. So thank you all and have a great conference. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, there are two things that are wrong with WSGI. Um, First of all, it's synchronous. It's synchronous in the sense that um, it can't handle multiple requests at the same time. I'm, I'm gonna put that in, in, in a quotes because it's not entirely true, but uh, we'll talk about this in a minute. And then the second thing, and that's probably more important, that it only supports the HTTP protocol. It doesn't support any other protocol. Um, so let's dive into that a little bit, okay. So if you are writing a WSGI-based application, this is kind of how your flow looks like. 
Um, you have a web server or a WSGI web server. Um, every request that comes in, uh, the WSGI server creates a thread, uh, an OS thread, okay, an operating system thread. And then uh, this thread processes your, your uh, request. Your code runs in this thread and you handle it and you do stuff and you get, go to the database and you do all kinds of you, whatever your application logic does. And then when the response is ready, it's sent back to the client. And during that time, that thread is blocked. Okay? So um, if you were to run a WSGI server with a single thread, and you are doing that when you're using run server, Django's run server, it's a single threaded uh, web server, you can basically only process one request at a time. Um, if you're running a production web server like GUnicorn or UWSGI, then potentially you can create as many threads as you want, but if you only have a few cores on your machine, it doesn't really matter how many threads you have, you are limited by the amount of cores, of, of um, CPU cores. So I said earlier it's not exactly s synchronous. Well, all your code is running synchronously one, uh, right, uh, one after another, and then you really don't get um, uh, a lot of options there. So how do we solve this? How do we, how do we get up? I mean, there are some huge systems out there, Instagram running on Django, Washington Post running on Django. How are they doing that? How are they processing so many requests? Well, what they do is they scale. Okay, that's, that's what they do. They just run more servers and more servers, and they optimize their code, and they run more and more servers, and that's, that, you know, it's a pretty good approach. Um, it solves your problem. Uh, the only thing that is disappointing in this approach is that it's very linear, okay? So eventually, depending on your code, depending on what you're doing, let's say you're a single thread or single core can handle, you know, 100 requests per second, okay? So if you need to handle 1,000, then you need 10 of those, okay? And if you need to run more than that, then you need to duplicate your, your uh, service. So the, the scaling is very linear and you cannot actually improve where your pain points are and where your um, bottlenecks are, okay? Um, so that's, that's one of the uh, biggest uh, problems of, of WSGI. Uh, the second problem is that it only supports HTTP. Um, Okay, so HTTP, if anyone doesn't remember, um, is a stateless protocol. It means that a client sends a request, request is processed, and then um, response goes back to the client, and that's it. There's no more connection anymore. And if the protocol is stateless, then it's very difficult to create stateful communication uh, between clients and servers, and stateful communication or bidirectional communication or whatever you want to call it, it's a pretty hot item. Everybody wants to do it today. Um, and, and HTTP just doesn't support it. So there's, there are all kinds of workarounds, okay? You can do long polling. Ugh. You can uh, do uh, service-side events. I don't even know what that is. Um, really nasty stuff. Um, so we reached kind of like a glass ceiling. Okay, WSGI is wonderful. It allows such a huge community of engineers all over the world to quickly build web applications with Python, but for some apps, it's just not, not really relevant anymore. So, there is a solution. And that solution is concurrency. That's, that's, that's a hell of a word. Um, let's, uh, let's see what, what concurrency means, okay? Let's look at um, Wikipedia. So, according to Wikipedia, concurrent programming is a form of computing in which several computations are executed during overlapping time periods concurrently. 
instead of sequentially. Okay, that's what Wikipedia says, and we all know that Wikipedia is never wrong, so we're gonna take that uh, for granted. Um, but what it actually means, okay, what it actually means, uh, let's, uh, let's see if we can use this uh, diagram here. Um, but before I talk about the diagram, I wanna make sort of a statement, okay? And my statement is that most web applications, most of what they do is they perform I.O. operations, okay? I'm talking about web applications, okay? Mostly, that's what they do. They go to the database to fetch data. They go to the cache to fetch data. They uh, go to the file system. They send HTTP requests to other servers or microservices or whatnot. These are all I.O. operations, and those I.O. operations are I.O. intensive, but not necessarily CPU intensive, okay? And then what happens, what ends up happening is that those web servers, they mostly just wait for things to happen, okay? We have those really powerful CPUs, and most of the time, you just wait for I.O. to leave or come back from some other place. So if we were to uh, look at this example, that I'm, the diagram that I'm showing here, if we had a single threaded WSGI server and it got four requests from four different clients, it will process them sequentially, okay? You'll first do the blue one and then the orange one, then the green one, you guessed it, purple one, okay? And concurrency is, all about doing it differently. And instead of doing this, we want to do this, okay? What does it mean? It means that, okay, I am sending an IO request to my Postgres database, and while I am waiting on a reply from my Postgres database, instead of waiting, I can do something else. I can handle another request, which maybe wants another Postgres query, or maybe wants me to get a file from the file system. Okay, so instead of doing all those requests sequentially, we sort of mix them together and we hand over control from one request to another, okay, in order to optimize what the computer is doing. Um, so here's a, another way of thinking about it. Um, if you look at the bottom video, you see a eight-year-old request and a six-year-old request happening sequentially, okay? First, uh, what is it, peach one, and then the white one. And then on the top video, you see them happening uh, concurrently, right? They're both processed at the same time. By the way, they're very proud to be here today, uh, just, just to let you know. Um, so, okay, okay. Good, good, you're saying we can uh, process one request while waiting on the other request? Okay, sounds good, but how, how do you do that? Well, there's only one secret ingredient to this. Nobody, don't let anyone tell you differently. You have to explicitly give up control. Now, I know people don't like that term, give up control, but I think that within our context, that's a very good thing to have. And, when, and, and, and the really the, the emphasis here on the, world, on the word explicit. While you run a query on your database, in your code, you will explicitly hand over control to some other request that comes in to do its thing, knowing fully well that someone else will eventually relinquish control and give it back to you once your query returns from the database, okay? I know that's kind of scary for first timers, but let's see if we can clear that up. Okay, so if you've been doing some JavaScript uh, in your uh, professional life, um, then you probably know this uh, pattern here on the left where I use jQuery to um, get some data uh, from a web server. And this is pseudocode, by the way. Um, and then as soon as that data comes in, I have a callback, an anonymous function in this case. 
and the and I call I do something with this callback once it comes back and uh, everyone who's done JavaScript before knows that if we look at the code uh, here on the left we know that do something will execute after do something else okay because do something else is called immediately when get is done and do something is called as a callback once uh, uh, the request finishes. In Python, we can do something very similar. Um, it depends on which version you're running, uh, but in Python 3.5, and I'm sure you've heard it before, we have those new cool words, await, and async, and essentially, this is kind of similar. It's not exactly the same, but it's kind of similar, where I call a function called fetch data, and fetch data isn't a regular function. It's what's called a core routine or an async routine. And if you remember earlier, I said we relinquish control. We say, okay, I sent that request. Now I'm gonna wait for it. Somebody else, here, go ahead, use the CPU. And once my data is fetched, I can do something and then I can do something else. And in this case, do something is executed before do something else because in Python, uh, unlike JavaScript 5, we have an easy way to write asynchronous code in a structured way, while in JavaScript 5, we cannot. In JavaScript 6, they kind of copied every cool thing from Python, so now it's, uh, they have a weight and yield and whatnot, uh, but uh, those concepts have been around for a while in Python. Before 3.5, we used yield from rather than await, and we used a, a decorator rather than the word async. Okay, so how does this work? Earlier I said that a WSGI server operates under the assumption that every request creates a new thread, and that the request is processed by the thread, meaning that if you get a lot of requests, you get a one thread per request. There are two problems here. Problem number one is that thread management is done by the OS, not by you, which I guess most of the time it's a good idea. Um, and the second problem is that uh, thread creation is expensive and limited. Creating a thread, destroying a thread is an expensive OS operation. It takes time. Uh, a single uh, instance or a server is limited with the amount of threads it can create, okay? Um, therefore, if your uh, server net has to handle 50,000 requests a second, then it's going to run out of thread at some point. Um, the way concurrency works is that everything is handled on a single thread. Um, and unlike that interviewee, I'm going to actually try to explain it to you. Um, so what uh, concurrency um, is using is using a concept which is called an event loop. Event loop is something which is triggered by uh, um, a mechanism in the operating system kernel. In Unix, it's called EPOL. I forget what it's called on Windows. And essentially what it means is that we can create functions we can call those functions, but we don't, we don't actually call them. We just declare them, stick them into the event loop, and then at some point, they're going to be pulled out, executed, and then shoved back into the event loop for uh, uh, our code to receive. Okay? So uh, here on the right, we see all those different kinds of operations which we can do um, and, um, asynchronously. We have file system access, we have data store access, and then a request comes in, it creates uh, a coroutine, it shoves it into the event loop, and the event loop, it has a queue, right? It, has, it just has a queue of a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, handles to coroutines, which it processes, and it'll process them one at, one at a time. And as soon as one coroutine explicitly gives up control, okay, Let's go back to that giving up control thing. As soon as you call await or yield from or 
whatever um, mechanism in different languages, you basically tell the event loop, okay, I'm gonna wait now, go ahead, run those other um, uh, coroutines in your, in your uh, queue, and then come back to me when I'm done. And to me, that's kind of like good citizenship. You know, it's you, you say, okay, I'm not gonna waste those shared CPU resources. I'm gonna wait on my thing, and then knowing well that I'm gonna get back the CPU once my data comes back. So essentially, this is how um, event loops work in a nutshell, okay? It's kind of a little bit more complicated than that, but we don't have time for that uh, today. Um, and, and then that really solves the problem of processing a lot of requests at the same time. The second thing uh, which uh, is really nifty and cool is this thing called WebSockets. We're gonna go back to Wikipedia here. Okay, so WebSocket is a computer communication protocol providing full duplex communication channels over a single TCP connection. Okay, first of all, do not mistake WebSockets with regular sockets. It's not the same thing, okay? WebSockets is a protocol on top of HTTP which uh, was created for single purpose and that is having bidirectional communication with a browser, that's it, okay? And how does that work, actually? Um, you have a client, the client makes an HTTP request to the server, and then with a request to upgrade. I wanna upgrade my relationship with you from a single direction to bidirectional communication, and then at that point, both server and client can send back and forth requests to one another, and then, uh, uh, each side uh, can also terminate the request uh, if needed. Um, that's really <laughs> the shortest explanation of WebSockets ever. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about what's available for us. Um, when it comes to libraries that, that, that do concurrency, uh, we have uh, Twisted and Tornado, which are pretty old. By the way, Tornado is just absolutely fantastic. Um, and if you are forced to use Python 2, then Tornado is probably your option. Otherwise, I would uh, suggest you use AsyncIO. Um, it's part of the standard library and it has a growing ecosystem around it and it's very uh, promising. Um, if you need a web framework, and let's not confuse framework with libraries. Um, then on top of async IO, we have SANIC, which I was exposed to first time here in this conference and I was really impressed. If you come from Flask, SANIC would be really nice. AOHTP um, is also a fantastic option. I've been using it for a while now and I'm very happy and I'm very happy with the way it performs and the way it uh, moves forward. Um, and if you are on Django and really doing non whiskey is not an option for you, then Django channels seems to be a good compromise and I suggest you look into it. Um, okay, the advantages are efficiency, kind of self-evident uh, by what I just explained. Um, having, not, not having to wait for something to happen and in the meantime being able to do something else. Um, it solves the C10K problem. C10K is, uh, you can look it up on Wikipedia, it's essentially uh, a description of what happens when you have 10,000 requests per second on your server. Um, you can spawn tasks and you can do it easily without a system like Celery and not salary is amazing, but if you just need simple stuff, then you can do that without salary. And obviously it gives you um, bidirectional communication, uh, and that's really, you know, if you wanna increase the user experience of your apps, then bidirectional communication is kind of a must have. Pitfalls, very hard to debug. Even worse when you have to test. If I had more time, I'd show you. Um, you really have to watch for locks and race conditions, and once you get your hands dirty, you're gonna run into those. 
And, uh, and the most important thing is, and I, I tell that to everyone, if you don't write concurrent code all the way, then you're wasting your time. So if you have a concurrent web server, but your database access isn't concurrent, then you've done nothing. You just, just it's, everything is not concurrent. So your code has to be concurrent all the way. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. We have time for questions? Yeah. Awesome. So, any questions? Um, so, you showed us um, the um, process with the keyword await, which handles um, the giving up the uh, control. What does the other uh, keyword is doing? So, the so, async, I mean. Async is essentially telling, take, it, it, it acts kind of like a decorator. It takes a normal Python function and it says instead of just executing it, return something which is called a future. And unfortunately, we didn't have time to delve into that. And then you put that future into the event loop and that gets executed on the event loop time rather than immediately. Once you get, once you dive into this and you get your hands dirty, you will figure this out really quickly. Uh, so you said that the main thing is that you should give up the control explicitly. Mm -hmm. Can you compare that, or can you just say a few words about like a solution like G event or like about the implicit uh, yeah. context switching? So gevent, uh, thanks for bringing that up. Gevent is, is an implicit uh, way of uh, uh, handing over control. Um, by the way, Django Channels is using gevent under libevent. Not really sure what the difference is. Um, and um, I think the main difference is that you, you really have absolute control over when you are handing over control rather than let the library figure it out based on what's going on. You know, I think that's the main difference. Over here. Hey. Yeah. Great, great talk. Uh, so you said async uh, returns the future, so coroutines return futures and the await keyword kind of gives control um, to the event loop and after uh, this is ready we continue with the rest of the code. That's yes. Great, right. Is there an API if we want to do something more complex like work with the future object, make a promise chain when everything's resolved, call this callback, something, something like in JavaScript world right absolutely, now? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the example I showed is like the simplest example. Um, uh, you can launch, does hundreds of coroutines, finish calling all of them, collecting all your, your future objects and then wait for them. You can say, okay, they're gonna happen one after another, but if one of them fails, I want out. You have a lot of flexibility. If you're coming from the JavaScript world and you're doing jQuery with promises and then and when and all that, it's kind of similar. It's not the same, but you, you have a lot of flexibility. Um, There's still time for one final question, so. If not, then uh, there will be a coffee break. Please give Amit a hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>